Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial session. Uh, my name is Pratham Guradia and I am an AI developer at Maker Bear. So Maker Bear is a non-profit based in Hong Kong and what we try and do is develop um, real life maker skills within the youth community in Hong Kong so that they themselves can you know go on and develop uh, real world solutions to the sustainability and social problems in their local communities. So uh, yeah, welcome again to this tutorial session. And today we are going to teach you how you can make your own AI based uh, image recognition mobile application. And this tutorial is going to be really um, beginner friendly. You don't, um, the tools that we are going to use, they're either um, no code tools or block coding tools. So you don't really need any past experience or prerequisites to follow along uh, through this tutorial. And hopefully by the end of uh, this session, you will be able to make your own um, similar application. So yeah, with that, let's get started. Now we were really inclined towards using open data for uh, this tutorial. And the reason for that is um, you know, open data is freely available out there on the internet and anyone can um, use this data to develop their own um, AI or big data or IoT applications. And for this reason, open data is a really powerful resource that, you know, even you guys can use to um, combat social and environmental problems uh, that are out there today. Now, uh, open data can come from a lot of sources. Um, one of them is scientific institutions and um, they release open data in order to, you know, encourage the people to use that data and try and develop their own um, AI solutions using that data. So for example, here you can see, um, this is the open data portal for NASA and uh, it provides a lot of um, interesting space data. And this is another uh, open data portal by a scientific institution, which is the Cancer Imaging Archive. And they give a lot of, um, they have a lot of data sets with medical images specifically related to cancer. And they hope that, you know, researchers or um, AI engineers out there can uh, make useful applications using these data sets. Uh, another source of open data is government bodies. So for example, here you can see this is, um, the Hong Kong government's open data portal, and they have a lot of data sets in, uh, of, you know, in different uh, categories. So here you can see, you know, city management and the um, weather data, education data and stuff like that. On the right, top right, this is the um, data portal of US census, and they have a lot of economic and population data. So for example, you can see business formation data over here and um, international population data. And on the bottom right is um, another government institution in Hong Kong is the Lands Department of Hong Kong. And this data portal gives uh, access to a lot of um, geo data or, uh, you know, land data within Hong Kong. Uh, finally, even international organizations uh, release a lot of open data sets. So for example, again, here you can see UNICEF, World Bank, um, over here, World Health Organization. Uh, they all have their data portals and they make um, a lot of, you know, statistical data open to the public uh, for research analysis and um, hopefully getting insights out of this data, which can help um, improve society. So these are two of the most popular, um, you know, search engines for getting data sets. This is um, Kaggle.com and it has a lot of uh, interesting data sets. Uh, and this is Google data set search. And this is more appropriate if you already have some kind of topic in mind uh, that you want to try and um, obtain data sets for. So yeah, it's similar to the Google search engine, but specifically for data sets. Now for this tutorial, um, because we at Maker Bay are more focused on, you know, uh, solving projects related to ocean conservation or ocean resource management, 
we wanted to pick a data set that is related to that topic. So we chose an open data set of images of coral species. Now, before we dive more into that data set itself, um, let's try and understand what coral reefs are and why they are so important for um, the oceans and the environment in general. So in singular terms, they are known as um, coral polyps and a coral polyp is a marine animal. Um, a lot of people get confused whether they are plants or animals, but they in fact are animals. However, they are sessile creatures, which uh, and this means that they cannot uh, move. They are stationary and they stay in the same spot for their entire lives. Now, the special feature about these animals is that they develop these hard calcium skeletons, and this is their most prominent feature. So, um, even in these three images, uh, what you're seeing is the calcium skeleton developed by that uh, coral animal. Now, uh, coral polyps are colonial animals, which means that, uh, you know, they live uh, in colonies or in groups and a colony of coral is known as a coral reef. So when a coral polyp dies, it actually leaves its exoskeleton behind and a uh, new coral is formed on top of this exoskeleton. So over time, as generations of coral pass, the coral reef keeps getting larger and larger in size. And this is actually one of the properties that makes um, coral reefs so advantageous for the environment. So yeah, let's move on and understand why coral reefs are so important for the environment. Um, firstly, you know, because of their large size and uh, their structure and stuff, they provide shelter to a lot of marine animals and they are some of the most biodiverse environments anywhere on earth. Um, even though they only take up 1% of the space in the ocean, 25% of all marine life uh, at some point in its life cycle it is dependent on coral reefs for survival. Um, secondly, there in coral reef ecosystems, uh, there is a lot of algae which uh, is able to live in this kind of ecosystem. And what this algae does is that it uh, carries out photosynthesis and provides oxygen for the ocean. Now in the ocean, there is not a lot of sources of oxygen. So for marine life to breathe and survive, it is very important for coral reefs to exist uh, so that there can be enough oxygen within the ocean. And uh, lastly, for beaches or uh, landforms along the coast or even human communities that are situated along the coastline, coral reefs provide a natural barrier for them, which protects them from tropical storms or large waves or land erosion along the coast. Now, unfortunately, because of a lot of factors which are caused by humans, such as climate change or water pollution, the levels of corals in our oceans have been declining year by year. And this is affecting the entire marine ecosystem, which in turn is affecting the environment and the global ecosystem. And uh, it is definitely going to impact us soon as well, unless, you know, we are able to make changes and uh, try and conserve the, these very important and biodiverse ecosystems present in our oceans. This is, you know, an example of uh, what a coral reef looks like. And yeah, you guys can um, obviously see uh, the biodiversity that is present in terms of the different species of coral itself. And uh, along with that, even all the deep different species, such as all these fish here, which use this coral reef um, as their home and uh, for survival. Now, moving on to our data set. Well, our data set was called the Structure RSMAS Coral Species Images Data Set. It was prepared by SCI2S, which is a research group uh, within the University of Granada. And uh, these are some example, you know, images from the data set. So the data set contained 409 uh, images of 14 different species of animals. And these words in the brackets, they're, they, 
this is how these images were labeled and what these words are is that they are um, keywords which uh, represent the species of these animals uh, and all of these 14 animals weren't uh, necessarily coral species some of them were even other um, sessile creatures which are uh, found in coral reefs and are often confused for coral themselves so for example this animal that you see here isn't um, coral but uh, it's actually um, sea urchins which are very popular in coral, coral reefs um, these are again more specific examples of what the data set looked like so uh, once you downloaded the data set uh, from the website of university of granada uh, you had these 14 different folders uh, which represented the 14 different species and in each folder there was between um, 15 to 30 images uh, of that specific sp species so for example in the first uh, folder there was um, you know these 42 different images uh, of this particular species let's uh, get a better understanding of what exactly our ai application is going to be so how we're going to use this data set is that we are going to make uh, an image classification program now what exactly is image classification so image classification is a type of computer program where um, there is these different uh, categories known as classes and you provide an image to a computer and uh, the computer tells you which of the classes the image belongs to you know in this example over here for the first image you provide this image to the computer and uh, then the computer tells you that it is most likely that this image belongs to the uh, category called might and then it also comes up with these other categories which are less likely that this image belongs to so um, its main prediction is that this image belongs to the mite category but it might also be a black widow or a cockroach but um, those are less likely as you can see by these uh, horizontal bars here those are less uh, they have lesser probability than this image being a mite and similarly for the examples here the computer predicts that this image is most likely a computer sh uh, container ship this is uh, most likely a motor scooter and this is most likely uh, a leopard. Um, currently, one of the most effective tools for developing image classification programs is um, machine learning. And machine learning is a type of AI and uh, it is a very powerful and effective tool, especially for these kinds of problems. And uh, this is where, you know, the AI of our project comes in is that we're going to be using machine learning to develop our image classification program. Um, instead of, you know, how babies use eyes to look at the dogs, the machine learning program uses what is, you know, known as an input layer uh, through which uh, we pass the images to this program or the pixels of the images to the program. And uh, along with the image, we also pass uh, the class that the image belongs to uh and using these um what are known as training images or example images the hidden layer which can be compared to the brain of the baby you know a lot of um, math goes on here and the hidden layer slowly starts to understand um how to differentiate between uh the classes of all the images that it is provided with and eventually once we um train this uh, program enough uh, and we pass you know we can pass a new image through the input layer but this time without telling the input layer what class the image belongs to and as it passes through the hidden layer and comes out uh, from the output layer at the output layer uh, the computer program uh, will itself be able to tell us which class that particular image belongs to yeah, it's not really necessary to understand how machine learning works, like behind the scenes, uh, these behind the scenes, the algorithms and the math behind it. Uh, in order to, uh, even if you don't understand that, you can still use machine learning and make useful applications out of it. So yeah, coming back to our application, 
uh, what we are going to make for the AI part of our application uh, is an image classification program. And the goal is that uh, we will give completely unseen or new images of coral polyps to this image classification program. And it should be able to correctly classify which of the um, 14 different species that we have, which of those species um, that image belongs to. So now let me take you guys through the process of how we develop this application. So the first tool that we used is um, known as Xsimilar or similar. I'm not really sure how it's pronounced. But yeah, you guys can note it down. Um, this is how it's spelled on the top left over here. And this tool allows us to um, develop our own image classification program without using any code. And this is what, uh, once you sign up and log in, this is what the dashboard will look like. As you guys can see, um, apart from image classification, which over here is also known as image recognition, there are a lot of other um, uh, machine learning programs that you can make using this tool uh, for example object detection uh, which is where you provide an image to the computer program and it can tell you what objects are present in that image and where exactly are those objects um, in that image so yeah even that is pretty cool and you guys can try it out you know later when you're uh, using it by yourself but coming back to our application so uh, yeah, we're going to do image classification again over here. It's known as image recognition. So we'll start we start by launching it Next we go to tasks, which is basically a list of all our image recognition um, Projects as you guys can see I, I have already developed uh, uh, An image classifier before the tutorial started But just to show you guys how it works. I will you know go through it uh, some of it again so for image classification uh, there's two different um, types one is categorization where an image can only belong to one class and the other is image tagging where an image can belong to multiple classes so for, for our application one animal can only belong to one species that's why we are going to select um, categorization and continue so over here you can give your project a name um, I will name this uh, Coral App Tutorial. Um, so as we discussed, uh, in order to prepare a machine learning program, you give it a lot of example images along with the names of the classes of those images. And then you train it. And once it's trained, the machine learning and, uh, and you give a new image, when you give new images to the machine learning program, it can tell us which class that new image belongs to. So we're going to go through that entire process right now. So um, in our data set, there's 14 different classes or also known as categories. And we start by creating our first category. So we uh, name our category. So similar to our data set, we will call our first category Acer. Um, if you guys remember in our data set, the first category was also known as Acer. Uh, you click over here to upload images. So this is our entire data set. There's 14 different folders. And I'm going to go to the first folder, again known as Acer. Press Control A to select all the images that belong to this category and upload them. So yeah, you do the same thing for all the um, different categories that are there in your data set. Yeah, so as I said, I already developed a classifier before uh, the tutorial. So let me show you guys what it looks like once you have created all the 14 different categories and uploaded all the images that belong to their respective categories. So yeah, so this is what it will look like. And as you guys might have noticed over here, there is just 13 categories, even though in our data set, there's 14 different categories. And that is because similar X similar um, needs at least 20 images in each category uh, in order to be able to train the machine learning program. And one of the folders in our data set did not ha had lesser than 20 uh, images. It had around 15, 16. So yeah, that is one of the limitations of um, X similar. But so yeah, you guys can try it out later as well if you guys make a similar program. Uh, 
uh, to try and add all the 14 categories instead of just the 13 we have here. Um, so yeah, once you guys add uh, all your classes that are there in your image, the next step is to train your, so these are all the example training images that uh, the machine learning program will use to learn. And how you, uh, it learns is that you click on the train option over here. Now over here, I have already trained it once. That's why it says, the button says retrain. But if you have, haven't trained your program yet, it will um, give you an option to train. So you click on it and it takes some time. It takes it's like around 15 to 30 minutes uh, for your machine learning program to you know use all these images and train itself. And once it has completed training, this is what it will you know look like. Um, it will show you the accuracy, like how uh, accurate your machine learning program is. Over here we have 87%, which is decent, but ideally we would want it to be more accurate. And what we could do to make it more accurate is to add more training images in each class. Yeah, once your model is trained, you can uh, also test it. So over here, if you you know click here. Um, so to, in order to test your model, you should use images which are which were not used to train your model. And only then you can see if your machine learning program works accurately. So here you click here again. And um, as you guys can see, this is my original data set, which was used to train the model. But then I have another folder known as test, where I took some images from the internet and created some, uh, and you know, created a test data set, which is different from the training data set. And you can upload up to 10 images at a time. So I'll select these first 10 images. Uh, yeah, once you upload them, you can click on process here and test uh, your machine learning model. So yeah, you can create your own test data set, which has to be different from your tra training data set um, using images from the internet from or from any other source. and uh, you obviously know what classes your test, uh, the images in your test data set belong to. I've named them accordingly here. The first one belongs to MDM, the second belongs to, you know, this Pali class. Um, so that way you can see how accurate, you can see for yourself how accurate your machine learning model is. So over here, um, similar to the example we had in the present, uh, in our presentation, uh, it gives you the class and the probability that you know this image belongs to this class so yeah this is uh, how you can test your model for yourself and see what percentage of images in the test data set your model is able to classify um, accurately so yeah as you guys can see it made predictions for all the 10 different images and yeah I won't go through uh, go through it right now but uh, uh, this program that I made over here, it got nine out of these 10 images um, accurately when I checked earlier, like nine out of these 10 images were predicted uh, accurately. So yeah, that is a pretty decent accuracy. Um, of course, ideally we would like um, some higher accuracy, but I think uh, for now it's okay. It can always be improved. Uh, our next step was to build the uh mobile app itself so yeah let's move on to that so the next tool that we're going to use is known as thunkable um you guys can see this is how it's spelled over here on the top left and yeah you guys can note it down and thunkable is a very useful tool which allows you to develop mobile applications uh without using any coding and yeah once you guys uh, sign up and log in this is what your dashboard will look like of course, I already have um, a lot of projects from earlier over here. But you can create a new project by um, yeah clicking here. You can give a name to your project, and um, yeah, I think the drag and drop beta, uh, the drag and drop interface. Uh, I'm not. I think it's still in the beta version. So uh, for now, I would avoid um, using this interface. So I would not check this. And yeah, you just name your project. If you want to give some category, you can give it and you create it. Um, so the project that I created for um, 
this current tutorial uh, is this one it's classifier so yeah this is what it looks like um the interface and mainly there are two um main uh, sections to think about first is known as the design section wherein you add all the components um your mobile application is going to have and as you can see there are a lot of you know components over here uh and you use the design section to add all the components and to um uh, you can give properties to the components over here and you kind of um uh you know use this section to decide how uh the application will look like what the design will look like where the different components will be placed and stuff and the next is the block section and this is the section where um all the behind the scenes stuff goes on right so this section in this section you can uh you actually get to uh, uh tell the app what to do you know when um different components are clicked and stuff like that so going back to the design section so as you guys can see i have um one screen in my app i have an upload button over here so this button and uh i'm going to use this button to let user a user upload an image from his gallery and uh the app tells the user which species of which of those 14 species that image belongs to the next is um this button the capture image button and with this button instead of uploading an image the user can use his camera uh to take an image right there and the app tells us which species it belongs to in order to show the outputs um i have an output label but i have set it um as invisible right now but yeah uh, it's over here and when the app um does its processing and returns the output um that is when it will be set as um visible but for now i'm leaving it invisible and similarly i also have an image component so this will be used to show the user what image he uploaded or captured using the camera but again for now it's set as invisible then there are some hidden components uh which you know it's not possible for the user to see so this is the photo library component which is which allows the user to um which allows the app to access the user's gallery when required again the camera component which would be used to capture the image when required right so the next component that i have added to my uh, application is known as the web api so what is an api an api uh, which stands for application programming interface is a tool which allows two different um, pieces of software to communicate with each other so the api is what we are going to use to connect our machine learning uh, program that we developed in xmlr to our thunkable uh, mobile application now usually apis have um, three main parts the first is the url uh, that you are going to call the secondly is the header of the uh, api and the last is the um body of the api so we'll go over to the documentation in xmlr and in the image recognition section in the api documentation uh, as we can see uh, there is the classify endpoint which is the classification feature of the api um there is an example here of how it can be used so this is using uh, the command line or you know ssh but uh, since we are using it in thunkable we'll just use it as a reference so the dash h here means that this is um content that belongs in the header so in the header there are two things firstly uh we have to specify that the content type is application or json and secondly we have to provide our authorization so uh, in the header we uh, have to provide our api token and this token it can be found um in your tasks if you go to your machine learning program uh, the token can be found here and if you click here you can look at the token again going back to thunkable in our api component 
um, in the header section we have added the content type we have specified that the content type is application slash json and we have also provided our authorization um token along with the yeah the token number going back to the documentation um so we can see here this is the url that is used for the uh classification so in the url section of the api we have added the same url and finally this is the body of the um api request and in that you mentioned the task that you are using so again um over for that you can uh, use the id over here the task id and lastly you provide the url of the image that you want um the api to classify for you so we will not add the body section over here because right now we, we will only get the image once the user uploads it so we will do that in the back end section and finally media db is just an online database that allows us to um, upload images we can upload images to this database and get the url of the image because, uh, without using this component we would not get urls for images because we would not be able to upload them online so finally i will um just go through the block section and how we programmed all the you know different components of our app the buttons the labels the um api the media db camera all of it how we programmed it and how we set it up to work together so let's go through that um again this uses block coding so let's just start from the beginning so when the user clicks on the upload button over here we call the photo library component and we allow the user to select photo uh, from his device uh, in the gallery if there are uh, no errors or if the user did not cancel we call the media db which again is the online database we call the upload function of the media db component we take the image that the user uploaded uh, from here and upload it to the media db to the media to the online database once the image is uploaded to the online database uh, it returns the url of that image the online url of that image so again if there are no errors over here we set the input image uh, uh, as the image that the user selected from his gallery uh, now we create the body section of the api so again as we saw over here firstly uh, so we can add the this section the records a list which specifies the url of the image so we add the records part and then we add the url that uh, the media db online database returned to us and finally we add the task id uh, to the body of the api so as you can see set web api is body to and then we combine these pieces of text and we create the body of the api now we have uh, specified the url of the api the headers needed in the api and the body of the api so finally we can call um, the post command from the web api component and this means that uh, we have given all the inputs and we are executing our query now so uh, when we call a post command on an api it uh, the output that we get is known as the response so again if um, there is an error it will show an error but if there are no errors um, yeah we get the response back and the response is um not really just one just a one word response it's um actually something known as a json object and it covers a lot of it gives us a lot of information back like the processing time the status of the request and stuff like that but the only thing we are interested in is uh the best label and the name of the best label 
right? So the best label specifies the most likely class that our image belongs to. So in this example, they were using dog and cat, but in our example, there is 14 different classes and the best label uh, uh, in section in the response will tell us uh, which is the most likely class that our image belongs to. So from the response, uh, we like manipulate, you know, the entire response. We get the, um, firstly, we get the record section from the response. Then from the record section, we get the best label section. So which is this one. And finally, from the best label, we get the name section. Um, once we have the name section, we set the output label component, which we had in our design. Uh, we set it to the name. Finally, we make the output label visible because if you guys remember, we had set them as invisible because there was nothing to show at that time. But now that we have received an output from the API and we can classify the user's image, we set it as visible and we even set the input image component as uh, visible so the user can uh, you know see uh, and make sure uh, see what image he selected and make sure it was the correct one uh, finally this is the last piece of code we have in the backend section and it is the exact same piece of uh, it does the exact same thing but instead when the camera button is clicked clicked instead of the photo library we call the cameras take photo function. Uh, so when the camera button is clicked, the user is allowed to take a photo from their phone. Again, if the user did not cancel or if there are no errors, we do the exact same thing. We upload that image, which the user took from their phone uh, to the online database called MediaDB. Uh, once the image is uploaded, it outputs a URL to us. If there are no errors, we take that URL and we use it in the uh, we use it to create the body of our API request. Once our API body is created and set, we uh, call the API's post uh, co command, which returns uh, the response to us. Again, if there are no errors, we take the response. Uh, get the best label section from the response, get the name of the best label and uh, show it in the output label component. Finally, again, we make the output label and the input image components visible. So just to go back to the design section, our app is ready, our machine learning program is ready. We have combined them all together. And in Thunkable, uh, when everything is ready, you can click on download here, click on iOS or Android, whatever uh, OS app you want, enter your email, send it, and Thunkable will email your final ready app to you. Yeah, so I will share the link of this Thunkable project with you guys. And once you guys make your own Thunkable accounts, you guys can access this, a copy of this project and um, go through the design and the coding blocks and stuff uh, in more detail uh, later. Uh, finally, Thunkable even has a separate mobile app which allows you to test um, the apps that you're building in real time. And uh, I used that to test out this app that we built right now. And uh, yeah, I will show you guys a screen recording of what it looked like. So I clicked on the upload image button and uploaded an image as downloaded, which belongs to the first class, the Acer class. Um, once I uploaded the image, yes, this is the output that you receive. So it shows us what image I uploaded and shows us the name of the most likely class that the image belonged to. So thanks a lot for watching you guys. I really enjoyed uh, preparing this tutorial for you. I really hope you guys were able to learn something um, useful from it, especially in terms of the tools you can use to make uh, your own AI-based mobile apps. Uh, both of these tools that we use, Xamular and Thunkable, are really intuitive. So I would really encourage you guys to, you know, just get started with using them. And I'm sure that you will be able to figure stuff out as you go along. Um, 
So again, thanks a lot and best of luck.